Welcome to the spacecraft charging uh, portion of our series on spacecraft EMC. The goal of this webinar series is to talk about uh, many of the different aspects that EMFX groups have to deal with for satellites in space and show all of that performed on a single model, single clean model from CAD, just to show um, what can be done and reuse of the CAD. So last time we talked about antenna siding. The video of that is linked at the website EMA3D in the news section if you go back a, a story or two. And talking about uh, antennas interfering with each other and looking at how the platform affects the uh, installed pattern of the antennas. Uh, in the future we'll be talking about uh, the interaction of surfaces with the plasma environment and the charging that can cause. Next, uh, in another seminar, we'll be talking about um, discharges in surfaces and in materials that can couple to radios and equipment and modeling that using full wave methods, again with the same model. Uh, also coming, we'll talk about ways that we can model the effects of thruster plumes and how that cloud of ions can change antenna patterns and uh, affect the link and look at the dynamic link of this, as the spacecraft is moving. Uh, we'll also talk about the interference that can come from the plume's breathing mode. Uh, also coming, we'll talk about RERS for satellite use units using power balance method or oversized cavity theory. These are statistical methods that help us analyze the coupling to cavities um, without using full wave methods and help us reach very high frequencies. But today the focus is on dielectric charging. And so Megan McGuire, one of the scientists at EMA who's done several projects related to dielectric charging is gonna talk through uh, the use of EMA 3D for dielectric charging in space. So at this time I'm, I'm gonna switch the screen over to Megan and, and she's gonna present Hi everyone. Today I'm going to be talking about internal dielectric charging of a GPS antenna in space. So spacecraft charging is an important issue for space vehicles, especially when it comes to material selection. While low conductivity dielectrics play an important part in the functioning of certain equipment, such as antennas, internal charging due to electron flux can lead to dielectric breakdown, which can compromise the integrity of the material as well as introduce risk of damage to sensitive equipment. Being able to simulate internal charging prior to de major design decisions can help guide in the selection of materials that are appropriate for the environment and the mission length. We perform this analysis using a 3D simulation platform, which we shown later in a demo. I'll also present results and conclusions from the simulation and how they may impact design considerations regarding vehicle compatibility with its environment. So we perform the simulation using EMA 3D internal which is a comprehensive tool for evaluating internal charging in a three-dimensional and time-dependent way. It uses both imported geometry and a user-defined spectrum to run a Monte Carlo particle transport simulation coupled with a quasi-static electric field solution to simulate the developing electric field in a computationally efficient manner. EMA3D internal allows the user to supply their own spectrum based on actual mission ephemeris. The interface was designed with AE9 in mind, so a user can supply information about the energy distribution of electrons as well as the total flux over time. With no limit to the number of time steps or the number of energy bins allowed in the spectrum, the user can choose how much detail they wish to include about the space environment. This allows them to closely match the environment that the spacecraft would be likely to see, which allows for a much more accurate analysis. The spectrum used in the simulation today is shown on the left. There's a two-day pulse spectrum consisting of 1,500 seconds of a constant spectrum followed by 2,400 seconds of zero flux. So this roughly mimics an environment that the spacecraft may see if its orbit passes through, say, the Van Allen belt. 
While the non-zero flux portions of the environment here were assumed to be of constant flux with constant energy distribution, thus allowing for a simpler illustration today, EMA 3D internal can handle large, non-constant, and non-repeating spectra, as would be expected from using a real mission ephemera. Non-zero flux intervals were divided into smaller time steps of about 30 seconds, as opposed to using the full uh, 1,500 seconds um, of the, the flux on portion, so as to avoid the development of artificial hotspots in the simulation. These hotspots can occur when the time step is too large or the number of particles fired per time step is too low. Therefore, by reducing the uh, time step length um, for the flux on portion, we can prevent the simulation from outputting uh, false falsely high electric fields. So EMA 3D internal allows for sophisticated and detailed 3D models to be developed in a user-friendly GUI environment. An attractive feature of the program is the ability to import native CAD from a variety of pro platforms offering greater utility to the user. Once geometry is either built or imported, material assignments as well as the mesh are controlled within the framework of the EMA 3D GUI environment. Today, we'll simulate a GPS patch antenna that is mounted on a spacecraft. The entirety of the simulation, from geometry development to the post-processing, was handled within the GUI environment, allowing for a streamlined method of evaluating internal charging risks. So on the right here is the G geometry used for the GPS antenna. Mounted on a ground plane are two layers of dielectric with a metal patch embedded at the top. The lower slab of dielectric is a moderately low conductivity material with conductivity of around 1 e to the minus 10 siemens per meter. The upper, upper slab of dielectric is a very low conductivity material with a conductivity of about 1 e to the minus 18 siemens per meter. In this simulation, we assume no radiation-induced conductivity, although that is a property that can be assigned to materials in EMA 3D internal. The first portion of the simulation involves a Monte Carlo particle transport analysis. The geometry mesh supplied by the user is converted into a GDML format. That, combined with the user-provided spectrum, serves as the basis of the particle transport analysis to obtain the location and time of charge and energy deposition due to electron irradiation. EMA 3D internal interfaces with Geomp 4 to perform the Monte Carlo particle transport simulation. The resulting spatial temporal charge and energy deposition profiles are recorded through tracking and stepping utilities and fed to the quasi-static electric field solver, which I'll introduce in the next slide. So charge and energy deposition information from that particle transport simulation is then used as the input for the quasi-static, quasi-electrostatic field solution. EMA3D internal uses a finite element approach to solve for the field by interfacing with Elmer multiphysics. From this data, from this, data regarding the voltage and electric field development within the materials over time can be extracted and analyzed and later post-processed in the GUI environment. EMA 3D internal is set up to provide efficient numerical computation for even complex problems. The interface with Elmer Multiphysics uses a hash table motivated data structure to quickly access the source data for electric field generation. The simulation can also be performed with parallel computing, which allows for high-powered computation for large and difficult prob problems. So much more difficult than this GPS antenna I'm presenting. So in the simulation that I'll walk through next, we will look at a two-day constant pulse spectrum with a planar beam. Multiple beam types can be employed to control the positioning from which electrons enter the problem space. In this instance, it was determined that a single planar beam from above the antenna would best approximate the type of flux that it may be expected to see. First, I'll show, up, show how to set up and simulate the GPS antenna with an EMA 3D internal. As this demonstration will be run on a single processor, only the first 10 minutes of charging will be simulated. I'll show results for the full two-day spectrum later, from which I use parallel computing, and we'll go from there. So first, I'm going to show the spectrum that I used for the simulation. So as you can see, I have the one planar source that I mentioned earlier. I'm firing 500,000 particles per time step, which is something I deemed appropriate given the size of the problem. And then, as I mentioned, I'm running a 10-minute simulation, so 30-second time steps for a total of 20, or 30, yeah, 30 second time steps for a total of 20 seconds, and then an overall uh, current of 1 e to the minus 8 amps per meter squared. So this is the, the geometry that I'm working with. 
So first, we're going to define the uh, material parameters. One second. Okay, so within here, you can define your materials that you're going to be using. So you, you can enter a material name, atomic number, and atomic weight. You also want to give it a density value. Um, you want to give it bulk conductivity. You can include information about the radiation-induced conductivity and the delta value that's associated with that. And then finally, you want to provide the program with a dielectric constant. So there is the option to use an internal boundary by defining a constant potential within the problem space. However, for this, we're not going to do that. But there exists a possibility. So this is a world box. I chose a two meter by two meter by two meter world box so as to fully encompass the geometry with some space to spare. And then I, I decided to do 20, 30 second time steps for Elmer to match the, the Geomp4 specification. So I'm defining a planar beam coming in from the top of the geometry, so the Z plane moving in the minus direction towards the top of the antenna. But there are other types of beams that you can explore. So next, you can assign uh, your materials to the different bodies within. So you create sets that will uh, contain the different materials. So in this case, the, the conductor, which would be that metal patch. Then we have the upper dielectric, the lower dielectric, and then another conductor, which is the ground plane. So for the conductor, I just did a basic high conductivity metal-like substance uh, and assigned it to the metal patch in the ground. And then deal one or dielectric one is that lower slab of dielectric with the moderately low conductivity on the order of 1 e to the minus 10. And then deal two or dielectric two is that upper slab of dielectric near the, near the patch that's a very, very low conductivity material. So you can see that what it looks like to have charging with variable conductivity within your model. So then you can double check that your world parameters are how you like them and then edit them here. So it's just a good double, double check method. Once again, you can do the same thing with your beam, just kind of see an overall view of what your beam definition is. And then if you want to change it, then you can do so in the definition area. So next. We need to mesh our model. So for this, it's, it's a pretty simple model, so you can use the built-in mesh button here. It's just a basic tetrahedral mesh with a constant line division. Um, however, for more complicated models, this would not be sufficient. So you'd want to actually use the mesh manager within the program, where you can control the uh, mesh element, element type, where I, I'm using basically a quadrahedral uh, rectangular mesh uh, for both bodies and surfaces. So then you can also control mesh style. I just use a basic map meshing for this for this model. Then finally, you can control sizing. So you can uh, like define line divisions for individual lines or for individual sets, which can help for a much more detailed mesh that can help create a much more uh, accurate model. So this is a mesh. It's it's pretty fine. You want to have a lot of detail, especially in the Z direction, so you can see the electric field development. Now we're exporting our, uh, all this information so we have files that we can then run in the simulation. So I'll take a minute. So yeah, this is outputting, outputting all, those, all those files that will be later used. I should say that this is the, uh, the Elmer, Elmer model, so it, it is a body surface mesh. Now I'm going to go into another folder. And this is a part that I'll clarify is a part of sim there, there are two parts to the simulation. You have that particle transport simulation as well as the electromagnetic solver. So the part particle transport simulation, you only want to have a surface mesh and there are certain geometry restrictions. So what I did is I, I did small modifications to the, to the CAD and exported that different mesh. 
into this folder. And so I'm going to grab the, the files necessary for that particle transport simulation, which is the, the G4 model, uh, the geo, which is your, your, your beam, as well as um, a couple other files. I'm going to move them back into the Elmer folder so that we can run the simulation all in one location. So I'm going to open back up the, I'm going to open these files so I kind of explain what each of these are before we move on to actually simulating. So this is just your, your, your beam file. You can actually modify the beam after you export the, the information. So as you can see, I just have the, the single plane with the, the beam moving in the minus direction along the, the x axis. And also output information about where the beam centered, but that, that is automatically done for you. So this is just the spectrum file that I, I introduced earlier. Um, so this is your this is this file is basically used for the, the jump four simulation. However, you can modify it to allow for radiation induced conductivity or to have finer control on the, the gridding used for your, your model. Next. I'm going to show you some of the other files. So you have the viz file, which is used for visualization later. I'll, I'll show you what that looks like in the, in the GUI. This is just that, that TDML code that's used for Geomp4 that I mentioned earlier. And then you have your elements and your mesh nodes that are used in the Elmer multiphysics simulation. And finally, you have a case.sys file, which is used to look at the uh, Elmer properties, so like the time step sizes, the number of time step intervals. You can tr control the output intervals, so you can control the size of your output file, your final simulation output file. Uh, this has information about all the different bodies that were included, such as the, including like the material that you assigned to it. So you can have you can control a lot of your simulation outside of the GUI, but generally it's not necessary. But yeah, so here you can control some of your solver parameters. Uh, yeah, so solver one, solver two for the voltage, for the electric field. Um, so expert users will want to play with this section a bit. And then lower here, you have your material definitions. So you can go in and change anything after you export it. So if you want to change the conductivity or if you want to change your, your RIC values, that this is where you do it. Next, we're going to actually simulate open our int run button. So you can, you can visualize what your beam looks like by, by doing about 100 uh, particles to get an idea, to make sure that your beam uh, is what you want it to be, it's hitting the right surfaces. Create the PDF so you have an image that you can save. That looks good to me. So now we're going to move on to the Geomp4 simulation. Hit this button to go, and it will actually tell you information about that initialization tell you any sort of warnings or errors. In this case, we don't see anything, which is good. Uh, it'll output percentage progress, as well as having a progress bar on the bottom. And so I let this run for about half an hour is how long it took. Uh, it won't sit through all of that, so I'll skip to the end. So it completed without any errors or without any issues. So we can move on to the Elmer simulation, which is that a quasi static quasi electrostatic solver. So go to the next tab and then you can just click start Elmer simulation. Same thing, it'll output a log file. This is also being written to a file within that folder I showed earlier. Uh, you can see warnings or errors that pop up. Once again, don't see anything here. So this one won't output a percentage progress, but it will tell you um, an estimated time left in your simulation, which can be useful for uh, trying to gauge how long these are. This took about half an hour, so total hour on a single processor for the size of model is not bad. Now we've finished our simulation and we can start post-processing. So this, this tab, what it is, is you input your, so the case.ep file is the output from the full simulation, and then your, your case.sys file, which has information about materials, and what's useful with this button, it, it, it will actually calculate, or not calculate, but find the uh, total max electric field within each body or within each material, as well as output a file that will give 
the max electric field at each time step over the full time of the simulation. So this, this can be useful for trying to figure out if your material will, will break down as well as when. And if you want more detail, you can also look where it will break down. So I'll take a second to, to process. Next, uh, I'm going to show how to animate the electric field. So we're, we're inputting our mesh set, selecting that simulation file, as well as the, the mesh nodes. I'm choosing to show a scalar electric field, and then that should, yep, so now we can animate the material. So I'm generating conductivity, choosing E field, and you can double check that it looks how it should, which it does. Now I'm going to animate it. I'm going to change the contour range to a user defined with a max for the entire simulation, so it'll stay constant on each time step of the animation. And then you can capture that. So I'm going to skip to the end. We don't have to sit through the whole thing. And so now you can actually save your your save this as a GIF so you can see what the electric field actually looks like in your model. So this is from the 48-hour spectrum that I ran on parallel. Uh, using parallel processing. Um, this is the output from the Giant 4 simulation, so it's showing the source or, or where, that, where that charge is deposited. So if you recall, I did a, a pulse spectrum, so you can see a pulse on, pulse off. So you can just double check that you're actually depositing charge as, as you expect. It's good double check. So then what I did here is this is the electric field, the absolute electric field results for the 48 hours. I cut into the antenna so we can see a cross section of it just just before the metal patch, kind of below it. So you can see how the, the electric field develops and how it's different underneath the patch versus other portions of the material. You can see how far into the that upper dielectric um, that high electric field penetrates, and as well as um, the lower dielectric. So this is when I was talking about how you can look at the the total electric field over time um, within each material. So in the red, I'm showing a pulse on, pulse off. So up here is pulse on. And as you can see, the electric field will climb during those portions. And then it stays static in the pulse off portions of the, of the spectrum. So it, we don't actually see any decrease in, in the electric field. So it's not bleeding off on this time scale. So that's, that's useful to know. And then you can see an overall trend in the increase in electric field for each material. So this is for the, the full 48. Um, so yeah, this can be useful for maybe maybe future in the future for fitting uh, to these models to maybe look at long time scale uh, behavior of the electric field within the material. So in conclusion, we've reviewed the complexities of a well-known problem in space exploration, so internal dielectric charging of, of an antenna, and presented a highly relevant analysis to assist in its mitigation. So this can help in selecting appropriate materials. So you can kind of weed out those, those materials that would be guaranteed to break down and cause a problem. So we've examined the susceptibility of a generic antenna in a space radiation environment using EMA 3D internal. We've also shown the risk as a function of dielectric conductivity and the time dependence of charging in, in those plots. So I'd like to thank everyone for, for taking some time to listen to this webinar. Um, we will open up to questions, but afterwards, if, if you have any questions that you forget to ask or, or you come up with, you can feel free to email either me, Megan at EMA3D.com, or Brian, Tim, or Nils. If you are curious in seeing the past presentation or staying up to date with new content, you can visit this, this uh, website here, or website EMA3D.com. And then I'd like to open it up to any questions. Thank you very much, Megan. So the first question we have says, for the time-varying spectrum, do you do the Monte Carlo simulation for all time steps? So yeah, it, it is taking into it. What it does is it steps through all those individual spectrum time steps. So yes, you do do it for every time step. Are there are there any other questions, or or maybe maybe uh, another panelist would like to pose any question? Uh, 
If not, again, um, I'll thank Megan again. There are the contact emails there. And then from EMA3D.com, uh, you can find this from the front page. Uh, should be the first news item, or, or you can go directly to the link there. Feel free to reach out to us with any questions. Um, again, we will continue the series. So if you signed up for the rest of the series, you'll see um, the same model used in NASCAP and for um, other aspects of EMFX. So stay tuned. And, and if you'd like a chance to demo this software, reach out and we'll get it into your hands as soon as we can. Thank you very much, everyone.